Welcome to this online talk on big data topics. In this video I'm going to talk about prediction. Firstly, uh, before even starting thinking about big data tools and tools for prediction, it's important to recall the distinction between correlation and causation. As Professor Martin Browning famously has said, correlation doesn't always imply causation. In fact, it almost never does. Of course, the most famous example is the correlation between uh, cancer and the prevalence of lighters in a home. So if people have lighters, they're more likely to have cancer, but that's not a, a causal relationship. But of course, there are situations where we're simply interested in the correlation and not the necessarily the causal structure. It depends on uh, the problem we're thinking about, the question we're trying to answer. For example, we want to predict who's going to get cancer uh, because we want to find them and figure out how we can give them some treatment. Then it might be fine just to know that there's a strong relationship between lighters and cancer. That might help us identify them. So sometimes uh, we're interested in the correlations. And that's when the tools here in our, uh, are interesting. One important tool or uh, concept in a uh, in machine learning and uh, when working with big data and entering into the engineering world uh, is the question of overfitting versus underfitting. Um, the uh, economists and econometricians have been long been talking about uh, the bias variance trade-off and the example that we've looked at in non-parametric regression is this these two extreme opposites of kernel regression, one that's completely flat which underfits the data has systematic bias here and systematic bias here. The other one is very accurate, right, very close to the points, very low bias, but very high variance. And these are the, this is the bias variance trade-off. And in the engineering literature, uh, they talk about underfitting or overfitting the data. And the R squared for the yellow line might be very nice. And one of the problems with that is that what R squared or the in sample squared error is doing is it's just fitting all of the data. It's telling us that you fit the data really well, but maybe you're just overfitting the in-sample data. So you're fitting the noise and not the signal. So one of the tools that you can use to try and avoid this is known as k-fold cross-validation. I've talked about the jackknife cross-validation or the leave one out, and this is the leave k out cross-validation. It uh, proceeds the following way. First, you partition your data set into K groups called folds. And then for each of these folds, you estimate first on all of the data that does not include the Kth fold. And then you compute the, in the prediction error for observations in fold K. So then what you're doing is you're fitting... Uh, you're, you're uh, gauging your fit on observations that you didn't use to fit the model. And then in the end, you average over these 10, uh, you average uh, over K and over the observations in of that. So there's an, an average, you'll have a prediction error for each observation for N observations. So to put this in math, you sum over the k folds and then you sum over the observations that fall in fold k and compute uh, yi minus the fitted value oops this one has to be squared of course it's the squared residual there's a to the power 2 missing here sorry about that so if i k is the predicted value of yi and this prediction is formed based on all of the data uh, not in fold k. So using all of the data, all of the observations that do not fold in the kth fold, but then evaluated it at uh, the observations that are in fold k. Um, and when we have k equal to n, uh, it's the jackknife uh, cross-validation or the leave one out cross-validation. And typically you use 10 folds. So let's, uh, let me show you here uh, the in-sample fit uh, where we're using a high bandwidth here to fit it. This is showing you that the blue dots are the data and you can see that not all of the blue bots, uh, dots are in the, the sample. So for example, this blue dot here appears to not be in the, the sample. And the red dot here is right on top of the data point. 
you can sense that there's a blue dot behind it. Um, so it's exact in the in the outer parts of the data set. It's exactly fitting each of the observations, and in the interior, it has this local average. This is a kernel regression that I'm showing you. Here we're instead evaluating the model at the data points that were not used for estimation. So one good example is down here. This blue dot here was in the in the data that we used to train the model and now we're evaluating it at these two dots, the x values down here on the x-axis corresponding to those two observations and because this blue dot is the nearest one then it sets their value equal to that one um, because the bandwidth is uh, is too high, it's overfitting the data. So um, if we show it together here we can we can see it more clearly that these yellow dots take their values from the red guy and here you have the, uh, the similar problem we can also go over to this side of the data set here you can see that this dot this value up here at this x value it's very close to this observation which was in the training data set or the, in, the, in the folds that we used to estimate the model so it's fitting instead of this y it's fitting the close one here the one that's right next to it so this error here is going to get really bad and when you continue and do this for other folds then maybe this is going to be in the in the data that you estimate on and then you're going to evaluate this one and you're going to have a similar problem up here so this is just for one of the you do this uh, this is five fold what I'm doing here so it's going to be done five different times you can uh, discuss uh, why don't we cross validate when we do OLS so in linear regression why don't we cross validate and actually go ahead and pause this video and and take uh, just a second to think about this question why don't we cross validate with OLS the answer is that uh, with OLS we just get one set of estimates out there's no hyper parameter to change so we don't have a bandwidth we don't have the uh, this parameter that balances how much we want to fit the in sample data and the out of sample uh, so 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 each time we would do a cross each time we do a new uh, fold we would get the same betas out there's no hyper parameter but when we get to talking about bagging estimators there you could uh, imagine something that has kind of the same flavor we'll get back to that so holdout samples that's a different thing from cross validation and it follows from this the what I'll call the the first commandment of machine learning thou shalt not compare in sample fits across models so in sample fits that's when when we compare the red dots which are spot on top of the blue dot on the data so there's a very small in sample error so in general when you're comparing different models and you want to compare their fit you you never want to compare them in sample instead you want to use a whole what's called a holdout sample that's what, how people refer to it so the way you do your estimation is before estimating you split your sample in two a training data set and a holdout data set which is also referred to a validation data set then you estimate your model on the, the training data set and you use cross validation within the training data set to choose any hyper parameters that there might be such as a bandwidth for example in kernel regression or the penalty parameter for lasso and ridge then you predict in the holdout sample and compute the mean squared error there and that way you're comparing the fit not on the same data set that you uh, in, that you actually fitted uh, your model uh, or estimated your model with. I think the reason why this hasn't really been done much in econometrics back in the day or historically is that we just haven't had enough data to do this. Our data sets have been so small that we really needed all of the observations in order to, uh, to, to estimate our parameters precisely. But really um, you want to uh, use holdout samples when you're um, comparing uh, fits of the models. And how do you choose this uh, holdout? That's really uh, problem dependent. And 
in some situations, it may be fine just to do it completely at random and just uh, just choose um, all of the observations are in the holdout sample with some probability. Maybe use 30% of your sample in the holdout. Um, but if, for example, if you have a panel data set of some kind, then you want to you may want to consider uh, stratifying across ups, uh, I so that you stratify over individuals and then you either pick all of the observations for individual I or none of them when you're doing your holdout sample. So this way if there's some within person correlation uh, that your model might be picking up and overfitting uh, you can try to avoid that. Um, and that can certainly be the case, especially when you start moving towards models where it's a little bit more black box what goes on inside.